five, four, three, two, one, cue them. From the historic Capitol Plaza Music Hall in Charleston, West Virginia, welcome to another Mountain Stage with your host, Larry Gross. Come on in and join the crowd right here in the mountain. Turn your radio a little bit louder right here in the mountains. Well, come up early, don't be soon. Play a little bit of your favorite tune. We'll have a good time afternoon right here in the mountain. Featuring the fabulous Twister Sisters, Denny Bonet and Julie Adams, the Mountain Stage Band under the direction of John Kessler. Our special guest from Selma, Alabama, storyteller Catherine Tucker Windom. Her name is Catherine Tucker Windham. You may have heard her voice on All Things Considered, where she's done commentary for years. She has a friend named Jeffrey, a ghost, is a ghost in her house that she tells stories about. Catherine Tucker Windham. Thomas, that Thank you, little town down in southwest Alabama where I grew up was on the Southern Railroad. A few years ago, the manager of the public radio station over in Tuscaloosa, WUAL, asked if I would do some recollections of growing up southern and tell a tale or two maybe on that station. He sent some samples up to Washington to National Public Radio and the people who heard them there approved of it and used them on All Things Considered. Thank you. How do you do? My name is Julia, Julia Tutwiler. Of course, you already know that. I've been introduced, and that's why you're here. Not because of my name, but hear me speak. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Your presence speaks to me of your friendship, your support, and I covet both. And your presence also assures me that you resent the injustice of my removal as president of Alabama Normal College. They've taken away the title of President Emeritus, too, you know. Stripped me of that honor. I made that school too good for a woman to head. So they gave it to a man. Thought perhaps you'd sing my song, Alabama. Many groups sing it on occasions such as this. Do you know that I cannot sing my own song? Can't sing anything, I never could. Father used to say, Junior, you write the songs, but please let somebody else sing them. Because she just purely haunts me. I just can't get her out of my system. She, uh, well, she lived at a time when women were not given a great deal of prominence in the life of Al in Alabama, especially in the South. Grew up during slavery times. Her, her father was a very famous Here's educator. Here's a picture of me when I was a police reporter for the Alabama Journal in Montgomery about 1940. I was one of the first women police reporters in the South. But on this occasion, I was covering a National Guard encampment and was learning how to defend against bayonet attacks, which I never had to use, but I was doing right well in this photograph. I had done some stringer work during the summer to the, for the Mobile Press Register, the Birmingham News, and Montgomery Advertiser, and edited the college newspaper. When it came time for me to graduate from Huntington, all I'd ever wanted to do was to be a newspaper reporter. And I went down a couple of months before graduation to apply to the Montgomery Advertiser to work on their staff. And I remember that city editor, Hartwell Hatton, had his pipe clenched in his teeth and I was standing by his desk talking to him. And he looked up at me and said, if you were a man, I'd hire you. I've read your stuff and you write well, but I'm not going to have any women working for my newspaper. And I was so shocked because it had never occurred to me that 
-hmm. Being a woman was a hindrance in any way to doing what you wanted to do. Growing up thinking I could do, do anything. And to be turned down for the job I wanted just because I was a woman, was just a little more than I could understand. So I went back to Thomasville after I graduated and helped my mother in the insurance office and did some more newspaper writing, some freelancing, until one day the Alabama Journal, which was the afternoon paper of the Montgomery Advertiser, got a telegram from them saying that uh, their columnist and police reporter, Alan Rankin, was having to join the Air Force and they needed a replacement and could I come? And I could certainly come. And I covered murder trials and finally got promoted, if you would call it that, to covering the Capitol. Frank Dixon was governor then. and He held a press conference every afternoon. And and there came an opportunity to move to Birmingham. And it was over two years I was with the news. My I, sister, my oldest sister, Edith, had the first camera that I ever remember, and it was a folding Kodak. And I took many pictures with it. We'd, we'd go take it with us when we'd go to Hill's Pasture, and took pictures around the house of my family and the pets, and. And I liked that idea of preserving on a piece of paper a moment in time and a, a person as they looked just at that time. When I began working with newspapers, I learned how to use a speed graphic. I liked to go to country stores and take pictures of the people sitting on the porch. And I liked to go way out and photograph old cemeteries and old churches. And and old houses, tenant houses, they're, they're disappearing. You don't see many of them now. And they had such character. Wouldn't want to live in one, and I don't blame anyone else for not wanting to live in one, but they were a part of the southern landscape that's disappearing. The disappearing south I'd like to preserve as much as I can. And every member of the family has stories to tell. And the older you get, the more stories there are <laughs> stored up here. Just waiting to come out for somebody to listen to. Storytelling. Binds the families together. You go to a family gathering and, and let one person start to tell a story and somebody else is ready to interrupt saying, but don't you remember, but don't you remember, but don't you remember. One story after another. Storytelling. It binds us together. It brings back memories. It says, I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Storytelling demands time from the teller and, and energy, and it's a gift. A real, a good story is really a gift, and a gift of love. But we Southerners have never begrudged the time that we spent telling stories. I think it's very Southern to, to weave stories of our own family into whatever kind of story we're telling. It's one of Daddy's favorite stories. I have to tell it to you. I have to tell it to everybody because I think it's funny. Mr. Jim Kelly. Mr. Kelly lived out in the country from Thomasville, and that was really rural. He had a, a beautiful beard, magnificent white beard, fluffy and soft, and, and Mr. Kelly washed and groomed and combed and kept beautiful care of that beard because he was so proud of it. it. It's really one of the few things he had to be proud of. But he was proud of that beard. Well, one day he was smoking his pipe, and he dropped some ashes on his beard, and it singed it rather badly. And Daddy heard about it, and, and he knew how upset Mr. Kelly would be about the damage to his beard, so Daddy went out to see him to commiserate with him a little bit, and Mr. Kelly said to him, You know, Mr. Tucker, if I hadn't been right there, my beard would have burned up. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jeffrey 
came to stir up my interest in Ghost. Now, Marcus, I think, you know, Jeffrey has to sign the book, too. And I'm just sure that's how he would write. It's a pleasure so, to meet you. I read your books when I was in fourth grade. Good, and you still remember? Yes, ma'am. What is your name? Todd Stimson. I'm from Mobile. Good to see you, and Todd. I just fell in love with your books. Well, thank you. Never have. My college folklore teacher, Margaret Gillis Fye, over at Huntington, and I wrote 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. Well, I got so fascinated with these ghost tales, these snips from our heritage. So I almost went on a crusade of collecting these tales and went into other states, 13 Georgia ghosts, the best known of Georgia's ghost tales, and 13 Tennessee ghosts, and 13 Mississippi ghosts, and then Jeffrey introduces 13 more southern ghosts. But I also gathered up enough stories to write a good book called Alabama One Big Front Poetry which has stories in it from all over Alabama. None of them ghost stories. And then I felt a crying need to preserve some of our superstitions. So I wrote a little booklet called Count Those Buzzards, Stamp Those Gray Mules, which includes basic Southern Alabama superstitions. I guess I still think of myself more as a writer than as a storyteller, though I spend a great deal more time telling stories now. I think the best Awards maybe I have gotten have been from school children who write me notes and say that they have read the books and they're going to write when they get older. And that makes me feel good. Or from teachers who say that I have students in my class who will not read anything. And when I tell them a story or two from your ghost books, it stirs an interest in reading in them and they will get those books out of the library and struggle to read them. And they're the first books that they've ever shown any interest in trying to read. And if I can encourage anybody to learn to read, because it just opens a whole world of knowledge to you. Just read. Well, I'm a born optimist. I, I get discouraged and I get despondent sometimes at the things I see and hear and get very angry. But I, I still believe in human beings and in the goodness of human beings. And it seems to me that no matter how far we stray, that at some point we're going to have to recognize the fact that we are dependent on each other and that we need each other. And something is going to draw us back together so that we not only depend on each other and can count on each other, but so that we can enjoy each other again and love each other again. My father always believed that if people could laugh together, that it forged a bond was perhaps stronger than any other bond that was forged. He said you can never hate somebody that you have really laughed with. And I'd like to see us be able to, to laugh again together. See us relax so that everything was not all that important because it's not. We build things up such out of proportion heights when they're not that important. We've, we've, we've lost our perspective about so many things. And I think if we can all accept that and then accept the, the fact that we are not perfect and we should not ex expect perfection from others, God made us all, and if he can love us, we ought to be able to love people most of the time anyhow. If we can just laugh together, this world's going to be a better place. Ain't that profound? <laughs> Pretty profound.